Jupiter, the fastest spinning planet in our solar system, with a day lasting only 10 hours. The biggest planet in our solar system, a gas giant more than 300 times as massive as Earth. It has rings of dust and colorful bands stretching across its surface, which are actually gases. And then there's the Great Red Spot, iconic raging storm, huge hurricane, two to three times as wide as the whole Earth. It's also insanely deep and goes around 300 miles into Jupiter's atmosphere. That's 40 times as deep as the Mariana Trench, the deepest oceanic spot on Earth. Way more extensive than scientists expected. Researchers have speculated about the Great Red Spot for hundreds of years already. This storm is circling Jupiter in its southern hemisphere. At the center of this giant spinning storm, the winds are relatively calm. On the edges, wind speeds go up to 425 miles per hour. That's twice as faster than the strongest hurricanes on our planet, 175 miles per hour. When there's a hurricane on Earth, it goes wild at first, but eventually starts to slow down. It finally breaks apart when it reaches solid land. Jupiter has a sky that's 44 miles deep. There are layers of clouds, and beneath them, scientists believe, lies an ocean of liquid hydrogen. The planet's core is supposed to be right under that ocean, but we're still not sure what exactly it's made of. As far as we know, Jupiter is a gas world, so there's no solid ground that would stop the storm. That's why the spot continues to rage on and on. Scientists realize the storm is constantly changing its size. Compared to data from 1850, it's shrinking right now. The Great Red Spot used to be three times the size of Earth. It's been a long time since it last got bigger. As it's shrinking, the storm gets taller and changes color into an intense orange, possibly because of the chemical reactions. New matter raises from the bottom of the storm. The Red Great Spot could continue shrinking and eventually disappear in the next 10 to 20 years. But there could be another similar storm emerging somewhere else on Jupiter, if the Red Great Spot ever ends. This storm might seem very deep, but it's still shallower than the giant jets of wind that rage around it and power the storm even more. Jupiter's bands of wind go to depths of 2,000 miles below its cloud tops. Jupiter is generally known for having crazy windy conditions in the upper and lower parts of the atmosphere. The middle part is called the stratosphere, and we didn't know what was going on there. Scientists usually measure wind power by watching clouds, and there are no clouds in the stratosphere. But when a comet, Shoemaker Levy 9, collided with Jupiter in 1994, scientists got a chance to study cometary structure and composition, and its effects on Jupiter's atmosphere. They discovered insanely strong winds in the stratosphere, with speeds of 900 miles per hour. Jupiter isn't the only planet in our solar system with crazy weather. Mars has the biggest dust storms amongst all eight planets. When such a storm is raging, it seems like it creates a blanket over the entire planet that lasts for months. One theory that tries to explain why dust storms are so big on Mars says airborne particles of dust absorb sunlight and warm the planet's atmosphere. This creates warm pockets of air. They start flowing toward colder areas, which then generates winds. These winds lift dust off the ground, which heats the atmosphere, makes winds stronger, and kicks up more dust. Mars generally has a very thin atmosphere. It mostly consists of carbon dioxide, and the volume of gases in the Martian atmosphere is less than 1% of that of our planet. But Mars used to be much wetter and warmer than it is today. That means its atmosphere was much thicker a long time ago. It created a strong greenhouse effect and trapped the sunlight. Mars used to have a pretty strong magnetic field, just like on Earth, the magnetic field on Mars was created by currents of molten metals in its core. But unlike our planet, the inside of Mars cooled enough to switch off the magnetic field. Without it, Mars wasn't protected from the solar wind. That's a powerful stream of particles flowing from our sun. It took only a couple of hundred million years, which is not much in space terms, for the solar wind to strip away most of the atmosphere on Mars. It went quickly because the sun used to rotate much faster at its earlier stages, so the solar wind was more powerful and energetic. And that's how Mars turned from a planet with a warm, wet climate into the cold, dry place it is today. Mars also has some interesting glaciers. They've been on its surface for hundreds of millions of years and can tell us secrets of the planet's past. For instance, that's how we found out Mars went through 6 to 20 separate ice ages during the past 300 to 800 million years. Satellites took images of 60,000 rocks of different sizes, 
They were distributed across the entire planet at random. If Mars had a single, long ice age, we'd find a progression of bigger to smaller rocks because they erode as time goes by. But the rocks were spread in clear bands of debris across the surface of these glaciers. Each band marked a different flow of ice, which means each of them formed during a different ice age. These glaciers are like time capsules because they could have all kinds of gases, rocks, or even microbes trapped inside. That means they could help us understand the changes in climate on Mars and tell us if there used to be any form of life on the planet. And the best thing, we don't need to drill deep down below the crust to find that out. Everything's on the surface. If you could go back in time, let's say 4 billion years, and visit the red planet, you'd probably see chaotic scenes of flooding. Scientists believe that mega flood happened because of a huge meteorotic impact. Because of the heat from that impact, ice on the planet's surface started melting. This flood carved out big ripples and waves in the sedimentary rock. Some wave-shaped features are over 30 feet high and spaced out 450 feet apart. Saturn also has its own unique weather conditions. Lightning bolts there can be 10,000 times more powerful than the ones we have on Earth. NASA's Cassini spacecraft was orbiting Saturn from 2004 to 2017. It captured lightning so strong and intense, we could see it even during the daytime. Cassini also recorded the sounds of those intense storms discharged into the planet's atmosphere. From time to time, Saturn has giant storms that go over 190,000 miles across the surface. They encircle nearly the entire planet. On Saturn's North Pole, there's a massive hexagon of clouds. It's a vortex of a pretty unusual shape that circulates hundreds of miles above the clouds and extends deep into the planet. But Saturn has its peaceful side, too. Along with Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, it has its own beautiful auroras from time to time. All four planets have an atmosphere dominated by hydrogen. That's why you can only see these auroras in ultraviolet wavelengths. These northern lights are especially bright at dusk and right before midnight. Venus has a giant storm swirling in the atmosphere at its south pole. The vortex is as big as the entirety of Europe, and it's probably been there for a very long time. The atmosphere on Venus moves 60 times faster than the planet rotates. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. Even the rain there offers no relief, since it's sulfuric acid falling from clouds and evaporating before it even gets to the ground. The sun also has its own angry outbursts in the shape of powerful solar storms. These storms bring strong radiation and dust particles that can cause serious damage to satellites that track the sun's activity to let us know if something goes wrong. Every now and then, a crazy solar storm can catch us off guard. About 160 years ago, a strong solar flare caused severe issues in global telegraph communications. About 30 years ago, a solar flare left 6 million people without electricity for 9 hours. One theory says strong solar activity could have caused the sinking of the Titanic. It happened on the same night as a fascinating northern light show. Some people believe a solar storm behind it had possibly disrupted the ship's communication systems and navigation, leading to one of the greatest unsolved mysteries ever. That there's something seriously weird about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system doesn't seem to have seasons. The measurements have been taken both by spacecraft and ground-based telescopes. They showed bizarre weather patterns on the gas giant. For example, cold and hot periods throughout the year, which equal 12 Earth years. And at the same time, Jupiter doesn't go through seasonal changes like our planet. On Earth, weather changes between winter, spring, summer, and fall because of the tilt of our planet's axis toward the plane in which it orbits the Sun. This tilt, which is 23 degrees, allows different parts of the globe to receive different amounts of sunlight throughout the year. But Jupiter's axis is tilted toward its orbital plane by a mere 3 degrees. It means that the amount of sunlight that reaches different parts of the planet's surface throughout its long, long year hardly changes. But the new study has found that there are still certain temperature swings that take place all over the gas giant's cloud-covered globe. Astronomers claim they've solved one part of this puzzle. They've found some hints that such unseasonal seasons might have something to do with teleconnection. This phenomenon describes periodic atmospheric changes in seemingly unconnected parts of the globe, which can lie thousands of miles apart. Scientists have observed teleconnection in the atmosphere of our planet, too. 
One of the most famous examples is known as the Southern Oscillation. That's when changes in the trade winds of the Western Pacific Ocean correspond with changes in rainfall across large territories of North America. As for Jupiter, when temperatures rise in specific regions of the planet's northern hemisphere, the same latitudes in the southern hemisphere cool off. Further research also revealed that when temperatures rise in the upper layer of Jupiter's atmosphere, called the stratosphere, it gets colder in the troposphere. This is the lowest atmospheric layer where weather events, such as Jupiter's powerful storms, occur. Researchers hope that by measuring all these temperature changes, they will eventually be able to make a more or less precise weather forecast for Jupiter. Maybe in the future, they will even be able to extend this to other gas giants to see if they have similar patterns. But this isn't the only mystery the gas giant can boast. Let's have a look at some other, no less intriguing puzzles. For example, a 2018 study that found that Jupiter had a delayed growth spurt. You might have heard that the most popular theory about the beginning of the solar system says that, at first, the Sun was orbited by a dust-filled gas cloud. Some time passed, and tiny pieces gathered together into lumps, which later formed planets. But Jupiter was the odd kid. It started off well. The gas giant was gathering around small clumps of matter for a million years or so. But once it grew to be as massive as 20 Earths, its development suddenly stopped. It could have happened after bizarre zones appeared in space. They emitted so much heat and energy that gas molecules struggled to merge with young Jupiter. This period continued for 2 million years. During this time, Jupiter only grew to 50 times the mass of Earth. But once this stage finished, the planet continued to gobble down gas like before. And soon, it swelled to its current mass, about 300 Earths. Jupiter's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot, a giant storm raging in the atmosphere of the planet and capable of engulfing two Earths. But few people know about the Great Cold Spot. It was spotted only recently when astronomers were checking data received by an observatory in Chile. It's believed that Jupiter's auroras spawned this unusual patch, which is around 400 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the surrounding areas. These auroras are ancient, it makes the spot thousands of years old, and unlike the great red spot, it's not stable. It keeps shape-shifting, and sometimes it almost disappears. But it always returns to the upper atmosphere. Usually it happens after a powerful auroral display. Now storms are no stranger to Jupiter's atmosphere. But where there are storms, there is lightning, right? Yeah, but the bolts of lightning on Jupiter turned out to be very strange. They release radio waves, which is not strange, but for decades, every spacecraft visiting the gas giant managed to record something bizarre. You see, Jupiter's lightning only signaled in the low-frequency range. And no theory could explain why, since lightning on Earth emits radio waves from low to very high frequencies. Finally, in 2018, the Juno space probe solved this mystery. Apparently, the problem was not with the gas giant, but with our technologies. Unlike previous spaceships, Juno had extremely sensitive equipment, and it came very close to Jupiter. So it did record both megahertz and even gigahertz strikes. But even Juno confirmed that lightning on Jupiter was totally different from lightning on Earth. On our planet, lightning avoids the poles. It prefers to zap the equator. Meanwhile, the gas giant's equatorial zone sees no lightning. It lights up the planet's poles, and its peak frequency is 4 volts per second. In 2017, when astronomers were searching for the theoretical Planet X, they noticed that some object outside the solar system was tugging at objects within. Thinking it could be what they had been looking for, they turned a powerful telescope in that direction. Coincidentally, that patch of sky contained Jupiter. And even though the researchers didn't find Planet X, they noticed 10 previously unknown moons orbiting the gas giant. This brought the number of the planet's satellite to a total of 79. But the coolest thing was that one of the newly discovered moons was very unusual. 
The thing is, Jupiter's moons move in packs. So two of the new satellites were spinning with a group that rotated in the same direction as the gas giant. And the rest was in a cluster spinning against the planet's rotation. As for our weird guy, it was inside the second group, but spinning with Jupiter. Unfortunately, it means that the moon will most likely have a short lifespan. An anti-retrograde moon within a retrograde cluster won't be able to avoid a collision. Look at Jupiter's beautiful patterns. Look at these swirls and stripes. For a long time, no one knew the depths of these bands. But in 2018, scientists used a novel way to crack this riddle. This method involved the space probe Juno, which orbited the gas giant every 53 days. Each time it passed by, it measured how strong the pull of the planet's gravity was. It helped astronomers create a 3D image of the stripes. It goes like this. The greater the pull, the greater the mass of the region below. And after examining the gravitational map, researchers concluded that the stripes ran shockingly deep. Most of them plunged to a depth of 1,800 miles. But Jupiter is a gas world, and the winds raging in its atmosphere shift all that mass around, making calculations very difficult. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system. It's 20,000 times more powerful than that of Earth. But the gas giant's magnetosphere is a bit wacky. It's unique and doesn't resemble the field of any other planet we know about. Before, experts thought that Jupiter's magnetic field was similar to Earth's. Two poles connected with magnetic lines near the geographical north and south. But Juno showed that things on Jupiter are a bit messed up. The magnetic south pole is pretty well behaved, but the north pole is a different story. Intensely magnetic ribbons and chaotic pieces of field some of them without even positive or negative counterparts. Plus, there seems to be another south pole. It might be that Jupiter's hydrogen ocean generates the magnetic field of the planet. And if scientists manage to solve the mystery of Jupiter's magnetosphere, they might also find out what's happening inside the gas giant. But first, they need to understand the bizarre behavior of the planet's poles. You shouldn't have made that bet with your friends. Now, your spaceship is hovering just over the atmosphere of Jupiter, a gas giant and the largest planet in our solar system. You're staring at the ginormous pale yellow sphere in front of your eyes, dreading your task, which is to fly through the planet and leave on the other side. Doubts are plaguing your mind. Is it even possible? Well, you're about to find out. Jupiter is truly massive. If the planet was 80 times as massive as it is now, it would have a chance to turn into a tiny red dwarf star. But even though its size isn't enough for such a transformation, Jupiter is still huge, more than 89,000 miles wide at the equator. The planet is so large it could fit inside 1,300 Earths. It's also impressively hot, about 43,000 F at the core. If you decided to parachute into Jupiter, you would never land on a firm surface because the planet mostly consists of gas. Around 90% of the planet's atmosphere is hydrogen. The remaining 10% is made up of helium with tiny traces of other gases. The planet is also surrounded by a layer of thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make Jupiter look colorful and beautifully striped. There's no solid ground on the planet. That's why astronomers define the planet's surface as the point where the atmospheric pressure equals that on Earth. You wouldn't be able to stand on that surface, though. It's just another layer of gases. But the gravitational pull there is around two and a half times more powerful than on our planet. The deeper you dive, the more difficult it gets to move. Under immense atmospheric pressure, hydrogen and helium gases turn into a dense fluid. Closer to the core, this liquid becomes a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium, which makes this region as exotic as the surface of the sun. Now, to imagine the gigantic pressure that exists near the center of Jupiter, think of the deepest place in Earth's oceans, the Mariana Trench. It's nearly seven miles deep, and pressures there reach more than 1,000 bars. For comparison, at sea level, you feel the pressure of approximately one bar. But that number doesn't seem all that impressive when you think about the pressure at the center of Jupiter. It reaches up to 1 million bars. So, if you tried to enter that region, 
your spacecraft wouldn't just get squished or melted. No, it would simply disintegrate into atoms. You won't even have time to say, oops. If you still decided to take the plunge, you'd have to go through different parts of the gas giant. First, you'd see wispy ammonia clouds. You might even enjoy a brief period of blue skies due to the same phenomenon of scattering of light that occurs on Earth. After that, you'd pass through some red-brown clouds. Those are made of ammonium hydrosulfide. And then you'd see intimidating towering clouds lit by constant lightning storms. Way deeper, between 4,350 and 8,700 miles down, your spacecraft would enter an atmosphere so hot that it would be glowing. This is where the temperature rises up to tens of thousands of degrees F, and the pressure rises to megabars. That's also where your spacecraft is likely to start to disintegrate. This is a mysterious region of Jupiter's interior we know little about. It's still unclear whether the planet's core is a molten ball of liquid or a solid rock more than a dozen times the mass of Earth. It's most likely the former. There's even some evidence the gas giant's core might be melting right at this moment. Scientists have suggested that it consists of a mixture of materials, including nitrogen, carbon, and even iron. In any case, not to risk your life, you'd better admit you've lost the bet and return to your hospitable home planet. Jupiter's gravity shattered a huge comet. It wasn't enough for the space monster. A real catastrophe happened. The shards didn't fly in different directions. They lined up and rushed towards Jupiter like the rail cars of a train. 21 fragments up to 1 mile in diameter burst through Jupiter's atmosphere. Fireballs at the speed of 37 miles per second bombarded the planet's shell. They heated the space around them to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's higher than the temperature in the sun's upper atmosphere and 312 times hotter than you need to boil an egg. Well, I'm not hungry anymore. The impact was like from a rock falling into a pond. The meteorite fragments formed giant plumes on the surface of Jupiter. Substances from its lower atmosphere rushed upwards. The process generated a tremendous amount of energy. Overheated streams of fire shot into the stratosphere. The monsters left behind them glowing plumes 1,900 miles long. That's greater than the distance between New York and Texas. Dark bruises appeared at the side of the blows. They were about the size of the Earth. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was the name of the violator of Jupiter's boundaries. The collision of celestial bodies happened in July 1994. It was a scientific sensation. For the first time in human history, a catastrophe of this magnitude was observed. The attack raised an important question for astronomers. Why is Jupiter unlucky? Space monsters attack it thousands of times more often than the Earth or any other planet in the solar system. All right, let's see. You decide to board a starship and travel to the mysterious Jupiter. A space probe would need two years to get there, but your starship is faster. You'll be there in… Great, the journey only took a second. Jupiter is actually big. It could fit 1,300 Earth-sized planets in it. It looks beautiful thanks to gas clouds. This planet has no solid surface, but there's a strange stain on its surface. It looks like a huge eye that can fit three and a half Earths. This storm will scare anyone. It's 10 times higher than Everest, and the wind rushes at a speed of 300 miles per hour. It's been going on for 350 years. You wouldn't hide from such a storm in a car, so it's good you're in a starship. If all the planets of the solar system merged into one super planet, the new object would still be two and a half times smaller than Jupiter. Large size also affects gravity. Spacecraft use Jupiter as a springboard to jump. The giant's gravity increases their flight speed and helps them reach their target faster. Gravity has turned the planet into a magnet for comets, asteroids, and dangerous space debris. Jupiter is a true space superhero. Its gravity shield takes a hit and deflects space monsters that fly into the inner solar system. The dinosaurs don't agree, but more on that a little bit later. What if Jupiter was swallowed up by a giant vacuum cleaner tomorrow? I can only say one thing, we'd have huge problems. Without a giant shield, thousands of comets and asteroids are attacking the planet much more often. Most of them burn up in the atmosphere or aren't large enough to affect us. But there are also larger comets and asteroids. After their collision with the Earth, you can say goodbye to all life on the planet. For example, in 2009, a celestial body crashed into Jupiter. It left a bruise the size of the Pacific Ocean. It's scary to think what traces it would leave on our planet. Most likely, the Earth would turn into a fireball. 
But recent research from astronomers suggests that Jupiter isn't such a nice guy. On the contrary, it's a bad guy with a slingshot that shoots comets at the Earth. A physicist used computer simulations. He found that Jupiter is equally likely to deflect and send comets toward the Earth. The giant attracts potentially dangerous objects and only partially protects us. It's already tried to knock out our planet many times. 66 million years ago, a cosmic body 10 miles in size crashed into the Earth. The energy of the impact set the surface of the planet on fire. It caused a huge earthquake and tsunami. A fiery rain fell from the sky on the Earth. There were millions of tons of debris and dust in the atmosphere. They stopped the sun's rays from reaching the planet. The nuclear winter began. This disaster led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Scientists have named this space criminal Chicxulub Impactor. Computer simulations of scientists at Harvard University showed where it came from. Chicxulub wasn't an asteroid, but a comet. This means that the core of its body wasn't stone and metal, but ice, dust, and frozen gas. It resembled a dirty snowball flying through space. The meteorite wasn't going to set fire to the Earth, but Jupiter intervened in the plan. It threw comets in our direction. In 1770, Lexell's comet appeared near the Earth. Our planet and this object were separated by only 1.4 million miles, close to nothing in space terms. Lexell's comet came closer to Earth than any other comet in human history. The object could have stopped life on Earth. The comet flew too close to Jupiter. The giant caught it and sent it in our direction. Now, this isn't a very good move for a superhero that protects the solar system. After three years, the comet went past us. It flew two times around the sun and returned to Jupiter like a boomerang. This time, the giant pushed the comet out of the solar system. But let's not blame Jupiter. Scientists believe that without this gas giant, life on Earth would most likely never have happened. Jupiter sent meteorites toward Earth, which carried organic molecules and water with them. They were the building blocks from which earthly life began. Nobody knows if comets would come with a valuable cargo without Jupiter and its dangerous gravity. If you fly away from Earth to the center of the solar system, you'll see the Sun. Eight planets are flying around this star. There's a belt of more than one million asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. One theory says there was only the Sun at the very beginning of the solar system's existence. Clouds of stone and dust surrounded the star. These particles attracted each other and formed planets over millions of years. Jupiter didn't want any new neighbors. Its powerful gravity prevented rocks and dust from uniting into planets. They remained asteroids and gathered in a belt inside the solar system. If today all the asteroids merged into one planet, we'd get a cosmic body that would weigh only 4% of the mass of the Moon. Previously, the belt was densely populated, but Jupiter's gravity threw 99% of the asteroids to other places in space. Jupiter isn't the only one that plays a role in the development of life on Earth. Our main assistant is the Moon. It's the only natural satellite of the Earth. Jupiter has 79 satellites, and every year there are more and more of them. Jupiter is also surrounded by rings, but they aren't as beautiful as Saturn's and are practically invisible. The rings are composed of small black particles. This is the dust that the meteorites eject into space after colliding with the moons of Jupiter. The moon is responsible for the ebb and flow of the ocean. It regulates the life of bees, fish, birds, and amphibians. Even you feel the influence of the moon every day. Changing the brightness of the disk in the night sky regulates the level of melatonin in your brain. This hormone is responsible for circadian rhythms, which are important for healthy sleep. The moon came about thanks to another catastrophe, like many other things in space. Millions of years ago, the Earth looked like a ball of hot lava. There was no water or air. It was enveloped only in carbon dioxide and nitrogen. At this time, another planet the size of modern Mars crashed into the Earth. Scientists named it Theia. At a speed of 8,900 miles per hour, it collided with the Earth. The impact of incredible force threw millions of tons of material into space. The debris gathered into a ball that became known as the Moon. Scientists have almost solved the mystery of the Moon, but they don't know if there's a solid core in the middle of Jupiter or if it's dense hot soup that hangs in space. Jupiter has the largest ocean in the solar system. It's made of liquid hydrogen, not water. If Jupiter were 80 times more massive, it would turn into a bright star. Jupiter is a unique place that will never be home to humans. The pressure inside the planet is 2 million times greater than on the surface of the Earth. 
extreme pressure and temperature would ruin any spacecraft that's gone too far. I guess that means Jupiter would have a crush on you. You're standing in a room full of explosive gas. One spark could cause an explosion so powerful that all the windows and doors would be just blown out with a huge column of fire. And you're holding a match. You need a bigger target than this room. How about the largest room of explosive gas in our entire solar system? Meet Jupiter. It's the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest one in our system. It's 11 times the width of Earth and almost two and a half times heavier than all the other planets in our solar system combined. If we put Jupiter on the scales, we would need about 317 Earths to balance it. But most importantly, it has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. It's the gas we use in our kitchen or fill up our car with, and it burns just fine. More importantly, there's metallic hydrogen. In its normal state, hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe. But on Jupiter, it's at great pressure, more than 400 million atmospheres. By comparison, on Earth, you feel the pressure of one atmosphere. So multiply that by 400 million, and hydrogen is compressed so much that it looks like liquid metal. Metallic hydrogen can be a great fuel. It'll give off 20 times more energy than burning ordinary hydrogen. So you and your match can have great fun out there. Okay, here we go. The first problem is distance. Jupiter is only one planet away from us, but the path is also blocked by the asteroid belt behind Mars. It's full of giant rock debris. On average, each asteroid could be as wide as the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. There's rocks the size of an entire state. And the biggest asteroid of them all is Ceres. It's almost as wide as Alaska. It's even considered a dwarf planet. And this dangerous journey to Jupiter takes about 650 days. That's almost two years of boredom inside a spaceship. By comparison, the longest time astronauts have spent aboard a spaceship is 84 days. But we'll let you take your favorite DVD collection and a couple bags of popcorn. At the end of the day, you'll be able to get some sleep after a hard day at work. Fast forward two years into the future, and you've arrived at your destination. You're already imagining lighting a match at the surface of Jupiter, exploding it like a balloon. Oh, be careful when you get close to it. Because of Jupiter's great weight, it has a strong gravitational force, about three times stronger than back home on Earth. The closer you get to its surface, the weaker you feel, and you can even barely stand on your feet. The maximum weight you can lift here is also three times less, and even a match you're holding in your hand already feels heavier. If you try to jump up, you need more effort. Actually, you can't even do that because Jupiter is a gas giant. That means it has no solid surface. Theoretically, the deeper you dive into these clouds, the more pressure you'll feel. Gradually, the clouds and gases thicken and form a kind of liquid. But you don't have to dive that deep. Methane is a light gas and it's closer to the surface. So this is the moment of truth. You take a match, you flick it on the box, and nothing happens. Well, let's give it a couple more tries. Second match. Third. Ugh, nothing works. Okay, you've got a gas burner in your backpack. You unscrew the valve to maximum, and nothing happens again. Well, that's because it takes three components to start the combustion process. The first is fuel. Luckily, there's enough methane and metallic hydrogen on Jupiter to blow up the whole planet in a matter of seconds. The second component is the ignition source. It's the initial force that will start the combustion process. It could be a spark, an electrical discharge, or a match like the one you have in your hand. And the last ingredient is oxygen. Yes, the same oxygen that we breathe. It's just as important to fire as the fuel itself. For an experiment, try lighting a small candle. Now cover it with a glass. You see how the fire keeps burning for a few seconds and then goes out? The fuel is still there, but the fire has used up all the oxygen inside the glass and the burning process is over. The same thing happens on Jupiter. There just can't be fire simply because there's no oxygen. And you didn't even have to fly there to find that out. From Earth, we can see hundreds of thousands of little meteorites falling on Jupiter. 
The asteroid belt next to it is to blame for this. When they hit its atmosphere, they start to burn. And that doesn't instantly blow up the entire planet. But don't be upset. There's still a way to ignite this gas giant planet. All you have to do is trigger a thermonuclear chain reaction on the planet. Then, there'll be an explosion so powerful, it'll be visible from Earth. And it will be like the birth of a new star. To do that, we need to detonate a nuclear reactor, like the ones that give us electricity here on Earth. In fact, we'd have to send everything we have to Jupiter. But even that won't do the trick. Big asteroids, when they hit the planet, cause a much bigger explosion. In 2009, a meteorite the size of five soccer fields hit Jupiter. It caused an explosion of 5 billion tons of TNT. This incident left a dark spot the size of the Pacific Ocean. And an even bigger explosion happened there in 1994. After that collision, there was a giant spot on Jupiter almost the size of our planet. But strong winds and storms quickly began to sweep away the traces of the explosion. After a few weeks, Jupiter looked like normal. The problem is that our attempts to blow up the gas giant took place on the planet's surface. We need to plant a charge the size of the moon deep below. A massive explosion will cause a thermonuclear reaction and cause the metallic hydrogen to detonate. The explosive process is set, and within seconds, Jupiter explodes like a giant balloon. But this spectacle will be the last one that humanity ever sees. The explosion would disturb the stable orbits of Earth and the other planets. The trajectory of Earth around the Sun might change, and we may see the dawn not in the east, but on any other side of the world. When the strong wind from the explosion reaches the Earth, it'll start scraping our atmosphere. Soon, our planet will lose its ozone layer. It was our shield that protected us from solar radiation. In such a situation, we'll have to hide underground for the rest of our lives. But even this can't protect us. Before long, the Earth will be showered with thousands of meteorites. Jupiter was so heavy that it held the asteroid belt in place. Without it, the asteroids would start flying towards us. Earth would feel a constant meteor shower. But there would be no one left on Earth to observe it anymore. Jupiter's explosion can be compared to a supernova. In fact, Jupiter is practically a star. If it were just a little bigger and heavier, it would start to shrink. The intense pressure on the planet's core would start thermonuclear reactions. Eventually, Jupiter will have turned into a brown dwarf, and it would be 50 times heavier than it is now. But because it doesn't have enough weight to do that, Jupiter is sometimes called a failed star. Well, maybe we should visit other gas planets in our solar system and try to light our match there. Saturn. Saturn's atmosphere is similar to Jupiter, but there's no oxygen for combustion there either. So all you have to do is admire the planet's beautiful rings and move on. Well, Uranus and Neptune are much smaller, and they don't have metallic hydrogen, so their explosion wouldn't be as strong. But you still wouldn't be able to ignite them with a match, because there's no atmosphere full of oxygen. But there is one planet where you could light a fire with your match, it's GJ1132b, and it's 39 light years away. Scientists think it might have oxygen on it, although it's not a gas giant that has combustible gases in its atmosphere. But you can still sit on its rocky ground and make a fire to admire the unusual sunset. Sand is everywhere! In your eyes and mouth, in your hair, under your t-shirt, and in your shoes. You can hardly stand. The wind is so strong, it's Ow! knocking you down. Suddenly, an especially powerful gust sends you to the ground. You crawl toward the back door. It takes you a lot of effort just to pry it open. Once inside, you get to your feet and sneak a peek outside. Just clouds of dust and a deafening roar. Okay, it's time to call for help. It started a month ago. One day, you went out to the garden behind your house. It was a windy day. You even spotted a tiny tornado under your apple tree. It hardly reached your knee, lazily swirling around tree leaves and dust. You tried to make it disappear by poking it with your foot. But even after several attempts, the mini whirlwind just didn't want to break apart. You shrugged and went back home. 
The next day, the tornado was still there. And had it grown? Interestingly, instead of growing taller, it got wider. At that moment, it started munching on your flowering shrubs. You got curious and decided to keep track of this unusual phenomenon. You measured it every day and carefully wrote down all the information in a special notebook. Maybe later I'll write an article or even publish a book about my storm, you thought. One day, you got out of the house to find your favorite apple tree broken. You couldn't figure out how it happened. The storm still looked harmless and too weak to damage a rather large tree. But after this accident, you started asking yourself if not calling for help was the wrong thing to do. Apparently, it was, because just a month later, your mini storm has suddenly grown to twice its original size. It's unsafe to go outside now. It seems as if your house is in the middle of a real tornado. You can't see the sky behind a wall of dust and debris. Your garden is ruined, trees broken, bushes and shrubs pulled out of the ground and sent flying somewhere far away. You hear your doorbell ring. A group of scientists you invited has come to the rescue. You show them the garden with your personal natural disaster and enjoy their stunned silence. But after a couple of seconds of initial shock, they spring into action. Ignoring the howling wind, they start carrying inside different equipment. It looks very complicated. Your kitchen turns into the researcher's laboratory. You get informed that your house will be temporarily used by the scientists. You take your things to the smallest bedroom and watch the professionals work. Your kitchen is filled with beeping gadgets and devices covered in flickering lights. People in protective suits and lab coats scurry around. Surprisingly, they don't bump into each other. Neither do they create traffic jams. You bring the notes you've been taking and hand them to an elderly man in a white lab coat. He thanks you as if you've just given him the gift of his dreams. The next several days pass in a flurry of activity. The storm in your garden is growing. The scientists seem to get gloomier every time you see them. It's around 2 a.m. when something wakes you up. You blink your eyes open and realize the house is shaking. Your homegrown tornado must have gotten so big, it's reached the house. In the morning, several scientists pull you aside to tell you the unpleasant news. You have to move out. The storm is indeed growing. Soon, it'll wipe your house off the face of the earth. Nothing can be done. You're gaping at the people telling you to get out of your house. Where will you go? They tell you they're building an additional research lab not far from the place. It's important to be able to observe the storm in real time. Anyway, there's a spare room with everything you may need in that facility. Why don't you stay there for a while? It would also be convenient for the scientists. They may need you to answer the questions that appear during the process. You agree because you don't have any other choice. The researchers help you transport your stuff to your new accommodation. You walk around your house, saying goodbye to your favorite coffee table, your sofa, and your cozy bed. The scientists tell you that there's no time to move your furniture to another place. The next day, you wake up to the news that your home is gone. The storm gulped it down at around 4 a.m. Over the next few weeks, the grown-up whirlwind has swallowed two houses of your neighbors, the nearby forest, several abandoned cars, and a small flower store. It's now so big, it's coming close to a large lake several miles away from the town. People get evacuated. The authorities have announced a state of emergency. One day, you notice that scientists are talking in hushed voices. They look even more worried than usual. You corner one of them and try to find out the truth. Soon, the scientist spills it. The researchers have got some evidence that confirms their worst fears. According to all their estimates, the storm that once started as a tiny tornado in your garden is going to grow into another great red spot. Only on Earth. Crimson-colored clouds are spinning counterclockwise at an incredible speed. Beneath them, you can see vibrant hues of the largest planet in the solar system, the gas giant Jupiter. Those clouds are called the Great Red Spot. It's a colossal storm raging in the atmosphere of Jupiter. If you found yourself at the storm center, the winds would be rather calm there. But on the edges, the storm's speed can reach 425 miles per hour. That's twice the speed of the fastest and most severe hurricanes on Earth. Over the decades, 
the size of the red spot has been changing. Right now, it's 1.3 times as wide as our planet. The storm's roots go as deep as 200 miles into the planet's atmosphere. The average tropical cyclone on Earth usually stretches for no more than 9 miles from the bottom of the storm to its top. The unique phenomenon on Jupiter has existed for so long because the planet doesn't have a solid surface. It consists of layers of clouds made up of vapor, water ice, and ammonia. Underneath, there might be an ocean of liquid hydrogen. Our planet is solid, and hurricanes slow down and break apart once they go low enough to touch the surface. But the Great Red Spot has nowhere to make landfall. That's why it keeps raging. The scientist also tells you the most bizarre and alarming thing about the storm in your garden. Instead of growing weak and disappearing many weeks ago, it's not only still going, but it's also getting bigger and more powerful. Even the most experienced specialists can't explain this phenomenon. After analyzing it for days on end, they've come to the conclusion that it shouldn't have appeared on Earth. It's against the laws of nature. Interestingly, the storm's composition is a bit similar to that of the Great Red Spot. You're impressed, but still can't get why the researchers look so worried. It turns out that your once mini storm is likely to grow as large as that on Jupiter. But since Earth is way smaller than the colossal red spot, it's likely to swallow our planet whole. It'll grow and grow, wiping out towns and cities, forests and highways. At the same time, it'll become more powerful. People will have to leave their homes and get evacuated to relatively safe areas until there are no more safe areas left. This process will take years, but it'll still be too fast for people to prepare. There will be two ways to deal with this global problem. One of them is to colonize the moon or another planet, for example, Mars. But it's an incredibly long process, and the storm will conquer the entire planet before the first spacecraft with people leaves Earth. Or scientists may try to stop the hurricane. There's a technology called the sunglasses effect. Billions of tons of dense gas get pumped into the atmosphere. This gas absorbs sunlight and cools down ocean water, which is the engine of any hurricane. The researchers aren't sure if this method will work with your storm. It formed not over the ocean, but in your garden. Hey, wake up! Quick, listen to that. It's a five-second FM signal coming from one of Jupiter's moons. You fumble for your phone and inform your colleagues. They freak out over the news and rush to the lab. You've been a scientist working with the Juno probe, exploring Jupiter for years. But this is the first time you've witnessed something so unusual. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon and the biggest moon in our solar system. If this space body didn't orbit around Jupiter, it would be classified as a planet. It's even bigger than Mercury and Pluto. What makes this moon stand out among others is the fact that it has its own magnetic field. The moon was born around 4.5 billion years ago. It means it's as old as Jupiter itself. This planet-sized space body takes 7 Earth days to orbit its planet. Everyone gathers at the laboratory, impatiently waiting for you to play the recording of the signal coming from space. Your colleagues get their game on, trying to figure out what the source of this mysterious sound is. Around 40% of Ganymede's surface is dark, with craters scattered around. And 60% is light-colored. There are formations that were probably caused by tectonic activity or the release of water from under the surface. Scientists managed to discover a thin layer of oxygen trapped in the Moon's atmosphere. The temperatures there are super low, between minus 170 to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There isn't much information about how the moon behaves or what chemical elements it hides inside. Some of your colleagues try to create the same conditions that existed when the sound was transmitted. For hours, they sit there waiting, but nothing. Maybe it was a fluke. You get to the control system and activate the Juno spacecraft. The main point of this mission is to observe Jupiter's gravity, magnetic fields, the atmosphere, and the planet's evolution. By the way, there's also some evidence that Jupiter's largest moon is evolving too. Since it has a magnetic field surrounding it, auroras pop up all the time. Those are glowing gas circling the moon's north and south poles. If life existed in such a place, it would probably be at the bottom of Ganymede's extremely salty ocean. 
For a long time, scientists thought that the sun was a crucial component to kickstart life. But now we know that there are organisms dwelling deep at the bottom of the oceans. Those are doing just fine without sunlight. The oceans of our planet are teeming with some of the most bizarre creatures of all shapes and sizes. Sea lilies live some 10,000 feet underwater. They got their name because they look like flowers. Except they're not plants, but animals. Don't be fooled by their stems and leaves. Those are body parts equipped with nerve endings to detect food around them. Goblin sharks are probably some of the most weird-looking sharks that live at the bottom of the ocean. They can grow up to 12 feet long and have a very unusual snout. Now, take a look at the anglerfish. It has a bioluminescent blob on its head to attract prey and navigate its way around the dark ocean floor. It's a natural flashlight that never needs new batteries. It's only the females that have these flashlights, though. The blobfish is another bizarre animal living down there. It lives in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, 9,000 feet under the surface. Anyway, even though you asked everyone to keep the news confidential, it somehow leaks to the media and becomes a new trending topic. You get a call from a news agency. They say they want to interview you about this breakthrough that may prove life exists in outer space. The next day, you head down to the news station to talk about your discovery. You have a whole live studio audience watching your every move as you reach out to grab your glass of water. The crew scurries around doing some last-minute checkups before you're live on air. The makeup artist does some final brush-ups. The sound engineer asks you to test your mic once more. Several of the producers are sitting in the front seats. Bright lights are flooding the studio. The countdown begins. 3, 2, 1, and… You're introduced and the host asks you to explain what it was that you heard. You tell them about the Juno space probe orbiting Jupiter. After a couple of questions, the host finally brings up the most dreaded one. Might the mysterious sound be coming from another civilization? Everyone leans in, waiting for you to answer. You freeze, not knowing what to say. Even though the crushing pressure at the bottom of the ocean is a thousand times stronger than at sea level, life still exists there. Algae, which is considered a delicacy in the ocean world, is off-menu for deep-sea creatures due to a lack of sunlight. Many of these bottom-dwellers have to munch on leftovers instead. Those sink down there from the upper layers of the ocean. The freezing temperatures and the intense pressure have altered the cells of these creatures. This has made them more resilient than the average fish. Bacteria were developing their own ways of surviving. Studies show that they feed on certain gases and chemicals, like sulfur and carbon dioxide. Methane and hydrogen are released when tectonic plates move against each other. And some of these bacteria feast upon those gases, too. Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic critters that can live and thrive in extreme conditions. You can find them in volcanoes, frozen glaciers, and even in the empty void of space. Which means that some life forms might actually exist on Ganymede. You explain this to your audience. Then you mention that you don't have enough information to determine if it was another civilization or a natural phenomenon that produced the sound. This doesn't mean that the bottom of Ganymede's freezing oceans isn't teeming with its own bizarre and weird creatures. There might be some legendary beasts like the Kraken or Leviathan there. Or weird glowing fish with two heads. A fish with tentacles and a large fin. Giant crabs. The bacteria there might be as varied as our own. The plants, if they exist there, have to be strong enough to survive the sub-zero temperatures. The animals on Jupiter's largest moon could be as big as our blue whales or as tiny as plankton. After the interview, you head back to the lab to examine the records once more. On your way home, you see posters of yourself with captions like, Are we not alone? Hey, you've become a celebrity! Many people take pictures of you. You've been booked by other agencies for more interviews. Some science magazines even want to put you on the front cover as the person of the year. Every time you come to work, you wait for the sound to appear again. But nothing. You send a signal from the Juno probe, trying to make some sort of contact with whatever produced the sound. Nothing. That night, you pass out on your desk once more. Eureka moment wakes you up in the middle of the night. There might be something you've missed. You run the numbers again and realize that the answer was in front of you this whole time. 
It wasn't another civilization that produced this sound. The source was electrons. Every planet produces its own sound. It's created when charged particles from the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere interact with one another. That's what happened on Ganymede. The electrons in its magnetic field, where the probe picked up the signal, were acting stranger than usual, and this amplified some irregular frequencies. You're embarrassed and spend the rest of your night making phone calls, telling your team the news. The agency that interviewed you releases a statement. They explain that other civilizations aren't trying to contact us. You sit back at your desk, waiting for the next big thing to happen. Europa is another of Jupiter's moons that may host life. It's made up of an iron core, a mantle, and a salty ocean, twice the volume of all the oceans on Earth. And just like Ganymede, the ocean lies under a water ice crust. Scientists claim that there might even be active volcanoes there, and some resilient bacteria may live there. With enough water, certain chemicals, and a source of energy, Europa could produce life. But it's unlikely that we'll find anything but tiny microbes. The fastest wind speed ever recorded on Earth was related to a hurricane gust. On April 10, 1996, tropical cyclone Olivia was passing by Barrow Island, Western Australia. At one moment, the storm reached the speed of a Category 4 hurricane, 254 miles per hour. That's faster than a Formula One racing car. You can probably imagine how much damage this kind of wind can cause. The only windstorm faster than that is a tornado. The air inside a whirlwind can move at a speed of 300 miles per hour. Unfortunately, there's no sure way to measure tornadic winds. Weather instruments never survive the experience. Oh, and licking your finger and sticking it up in the wind to measure speed also isn't a good idea here, unless you don't mind losing your arm or worse. Here are some more numbers. 35 miles per hour and more, that's the speed of the average blizzard. 50 to 60 miles per hour, that's how fast a severe thunderstorm moves. More than 74 miles per hour is the speed of a powerful tropical hurricane. Up to 400 miles per hour? Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but you need to travel to Jupiter to see a storm that speedy. The Great Red Spot is an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the surrounding cloud tops. The storm's almost three times as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that the monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But since these measurements were most likely imprecise, the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere, and Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in its upper cloud layers. The closer it is to the core, the hotter it gets. But the highest temperatures ever recorded on the planet were in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat can reach 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than lava on our planet. The storm's extreme conditions and turbulence produce gravitational and sound waves. These waves might be responsible for the superheating. The storm itself is also warmer at its bottom than at the top. If you found yourself at its center, you wouldn't be too impressed. But on the edges, the wind speed reaches 300 to 420 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. Now, this will help you picture the immense force of such winds. On Earth, the wind doesn't have to be faster than 60 miles per hour to lift a person as heavy as 170 pounds from the ground. A wind as fast as 75 miles per hour can uproot large trees, peel off roofs, break windows, and turn over mobile homes. When the wind speed reaches 150, it can send cars flying. Now picture the havoc a storm as powerful as the Great Red Spot can cause on our planet. But could such an enormous anti-cyclone occur on Earth? Luckily, not. Our planet doesn't have the unique conditions needed for the storm to form. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. And it was mostly the fault of the storm's home planet. It's more than a thousand times larger than Earth and over 300 times as massive. 
Jupiter is a gas giant, which means it consists mostly of fill-in-the-blank. Around the planet's core, there's an ocean of liquid hydrogen. And the atmosphere is also mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. That means Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, the only thing that could make the storm weaken. Without any friction, the storm has already been churning for centuries. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, and swirling. Just like on our planet, when cooler and hotter gases mix and merge into one another, they form giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms came together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps raging by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, this monster of a storm absorbs other smaller vortices. They make the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow people to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Astronomers have been speculating on what may lie beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Could it be a massive volcano? Unlikely. Jupiter's mostly gas. That's why it doesn't have a crust that could crack and release scorching hot stuff from the planet's interior. Several theories try to explain why the storm has its trademark color. It varies from whitish and pale salmon to orange and brick red. Some scientists believe the answer lies below the Great Red Spot, closer to the planet's surface. A colorless layer of ammonium hydrosulfide might be reacting with cosmic rays or the UV radiation coming from the sun. This somehow gives the spot its pretty red color. But so far, it's just a theory. Astronomers have been observing the Great Red Spot since the 1830s. And for the first time, the storm was spotted in 1665 and described as the permanent spot. In other words, the storm is almost 400 years old. Strangely, it's been shrinking in size since the beginning of the 21st century. In 2019, it began flaking at the edges, with smaller pieces breaking off and vanishing. If this process continues, by 2040, the Great Red Spot will become circular, or it may disappear altogether. The storm isn't only getting smaller, it's also growing taller and getting a more intense orange hue. It's not completely clear why it's happening. Might be because of a chemical reaction. It occurs when some new material rises to the top layers of the atmosphere from below. The Great Red Spot might be the most famous storm in the solar system, but it's by no means the only one. Even on Jupiter, there's a bit less known Little Red Spot. One more anticyclone, but smaller in size. Well, when I say smaller, I mean the thing's not as large as its big sister. But it's still about the size of Earth. Recently, the highest wind speed inside the Little Red Spot has increased up to 400 miles per hour. A storm as wide as our planet rages on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. The storm has a tail of white clouds encircling the entire planet. It occurs every 30 years or so, when Saturn's northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun. This storm indeed starts as a spot, but then it stretches in length. Astronomers have figured out that the Great White Spot is actually a huge system of thunderstorms. At the peak of the storm, lightning can flash more than 10 times per second. But the main mystery about the Great White it's where it gets its energy from. Some scientists think it may be powered by the sun. Others argue that the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal heat source that can power the winds. Great dark spots on Neptune are massive storms that form in areas with high atmospheric pressure. That's different on Earth. Here, storms appear when the pressure is low. Around the spot's edges, the wind speeds can reach 1,300 miles per hour. Astronomers have observed six dark spots on Neptune so far. These powerful storms get born deep in the planet's atmosphere. And the darker a storm is, the brighter the methane clouds around it are. Another monster-sized storm raging on Saturn looks pretty much like a hurricane or typhoon on our planet. It has an eye and spiraling clouds surrounding it. 
But compared to Earth's hurricanes, the one on the ring planet is titanic. On Saturn, the eye of the storm is up to 1,250 miles across. The bright clouds closer to the edges of the hurricane are moving at a speed of 330 miles per hour. But one of the most unusual things about this storm is its shape. It has six sides and is known as the hexagon. When astronomers saw the first images with the vortex, they did a double take. The thing was just too similar to our storms. And still, the one whirling on Saturn has an eye that's almost 20 times larger than any people have seen on Earth. The storm also moves four times faster than hurricane winds on our planet. Saturn's atmosphere has little water vapor. How the bizarre hexagon storm is getting by in such conditions is a mystery. Plus, unlike the constantly drifting hurricanes on Earth, the one on Saturn seems to have nowhere to go. For some inexplicable reason, it's stuck at the planet's North Pole.